So, um, if you don't know who I am, and someone, and you're new here, and someone told you, hey, you should come to church and listen to our Pastor Dante. Uh, I'm not Pastor Dante, <laughs> in case you didn't know that. Uh, my name is Jonathan Lord, uh, along with me and my wife Lacey, we have the awesome opportunity to uh, be the youth pastors here at Faith Fellowship. Um, it's a really good time, and <laughs> thanks. So, um, pastor is actually at a youth conference, believe it or not. I know the youth pastors here, the senior pastors at the youth conference, but it is what it is. Um, he's out there. He got invited to be basically the main speaker they have at this conference. So um, I believe he's coming back today, right? Is he on? So he'll be traveling back today. So keep him in your prayers as he travels back. And um, before I go any farther, I want to go ahead and honor our senior pastor and his wife. Without their amazing leadership, this church would not be what it is today. So can we give it up for them? And then, before I go any further, we have to, if we're going to give it up for the pastor, we have to give it up for his ultimate leader, which is God. And can we just give God some honor and some praise? All right, so I'm going to go ahead and, um, actually, let me back up a little bit. So we've been in this series about discipleship, right? If you've uh, been coming around, been hanging out the past few weeks, we've been talking a lot about discipleship. Um, today, I'm probably going to do just a little bit of review. Hopefully, I don't get stuck on that too much. Um... But we've been talking about discipleship, and I was thinking about, pastor asked me to speak, and I was thinking about, all right, what do you want me to speak on? What am I going to talk about? Um, I was racking my brain trying to think of something that he didn't already cover. You know what I mean? Like, sometimes we think about discipleship, and there are the basics that we cover, and he's definitely covered those, and I'm sure he plans on going into more. Um, but one thing that I began to think about was just, we think about discipleship in the way that we need to be discipled today. And that is obviously the most pertinent thing to our own discipleship. But the one thing that I thought about, well, what was it like to be the disciples, the people that we look at as the apostles? So I started looking at the different things in the way that they, um, the different, like, because we, sometimes we read the Bible and we get to read things in retrospect, Right? And sometimes I think we forget to put ourselves and think about like what is, what's going on with the disciples as this is happening, right? Um, so with that being said, the, the idea, I think that we went, came up with the name for this, the roadmap, and, I, um, and this is basically a roadmap of how the disciples went from these fishermen and tax collectors and, and just young men who ultimately became the apostles that started the church, that wrote the New Testament, that became the, the men that we know who they are today. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and get into it. Um, I have a couple different points, and we're just going to go ahead and go with it as uh, however it goes. Um, bear with me a little bit. One of my instructors, for those of you who don't know, I am enrolled at Rainbow Bible Training College, um, and I had an instructor that said, um, said something to me, and he said, or he didn't say it to me, but he said it to the class, he said, all of you have a gift, and whether or not you'll step into a platform or a public-type ministry, all of you have a gift inside of you that you need to start developing now. So I'm going to put that out to all of you. All of you have a gift in you that is for some form of ministry. Start developing it now. You may have a vision for you to plant some nonprofit or do something, but if you don't start preparing for it now, it will not be what God wants it to be when you get there. You have to prepare ahead of time. So with that being said, I started seeking God and was like, all right, God, what are some of the ways that I can start getting better at the craft that you've given me? So I'm still practicing those. Okay. So just bear with me a little bit. So I changed up a few things in the way I try to present things and it's been a little bit of a rough go at it, but we're working at it. So point number one or whatever is uh, choose to follow. And the reason why I looked at this is pastor came, talked about a couple days and the way that Jesus chose his disciples is different than most disciples would have been. He explained to us how most disciples, when they chose to follow someone, they would come up and ask that man, can I follow you? And he would give them the yes or the no. Jesus did something different. He came up and picked the people, said, you come with me, you come with me. So he did things differently. But I think sometimes we forget, to, to, we forget that they still had to make the decision to follow him. So in Matthew 4.18, make sure I'm there, it says, now Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee and saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew, casting their nets in the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. But what I think, but Luke tells us a different uh, version of that story. 
And that's in Luke 5. Let me get there. See, I told you I was doing things differently. Yes, I know that that's probably up on the board, but one of the things that God told me to do is like, you need to get better at getting through your Bible that you have that I told you to pick out. So that's what I'm doing. So this is Luke 5. We're going to start in verse 1. We'll go through 11. Now it happened while the crowd was passing around him and listening to the word of God. He was standing by the uh, lake of, uh, that's a hard word, Gennesaret, and he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little distance from the land, and he sat down and continued teaching the crowds from the boat. Now when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon responded and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I know, but I will do as you say, and I will let down the nets. And when the nets had, and when they had done this, they caught a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to tear. So they signaled to their partners in the other boats to come and help them, and they came and filled their boats to the point where they were sinking. But when Simon saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And likewise also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon and Jesus, said to Simon, Do, do not fear, from now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to him, they left everything and followed him. So we look at the disciples, and if we were just read that account of Matthew, we would look and be like, oh, well, Jesus said, hey, come with me, and they just got up and went. But when we actually look what Luke tells us about this, that there was more to it. Jesus had proven himself worthy of being followed. He came to them, and he showed them a miracle. He showed them something that they would never be able to do on their own. And from there, they decided this is a man that is worth following. So we all have to choose to follow. And I'm pretty sure I recognize most of the faces in here. I, made, I imagine that most of us have made the decision to follow. But just in case you haven't, you don't know if you actually are called to follow, 2 Thessalonians, let me find it. 2 Thessalonians, that's always a hard one for me. 2 Thessalonians 2.14 tells us, Remind them of these things, and solemnly, and solemnly exhort them in the presence of God. Do not dispute about words, which is useless. Which, oh, that's not what I meant to read. That's the second letter of Timothy. See? See, I told you, bear with me. I'm learning. There we go. That's better. For it was for this he called you through our gospel that he may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. He called every single one of us. Each person is called to follow Jesus, and it's up to us to make the decision that we have to follow. And once you make the decision to follow, there's steps after that. So like I said, I imagine most of us in here have made that decision to follow. But the next decision that we have to be made, and this is what we spent a lot of time talking about over the past few weeks, is be taught. Jesus taught his disciples, and he taught his disciples, right? He, he went around, he, did, he was teaching, he was doing all these things. And there was a lot of things that Jesus talked about, but a lot of the things he wanted to, but I'm going to talk about a few of the things that he taught about the most. One was the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God. That, that phrase, kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God, is mentioned 92 times in the Gospels alone. So Jesus went about teaching about the kingdom. He went about teaching what to do. He taught about love. Jesus taught about forgiveness. He said, if you do not forgive, neither will my Father in heaven forgive you. And that's a hard pill to swallow, for, I think, for a lot of us. He told us that we need to love our neighbor. He taught us about faith, right? He taught us that we need to have faith, whatever you say. For he who believes, whatever he sa- if he says to this mountain, be thou cast into the sea, and he believes in his heart and does not doubt, whatever he asks will be given to him. He taught about faith. He also taught about power over sickness. And he told us that we have authority over sickness and over demons, right? And that leads me into the next thing. is Eventually, everything that Jesus had taught them, he told them, you have to go do this now. He put them into action. And I'm not talking about the Great Commission. We're getting there. Don't worry. But that wasn't there. When we look, we can look in Matthew 10, 1 through 5. If you want to go ahead and turn there. This is the part where Jesus gave his disciples authority. Go back. I see my instructors do this at school, and they make it look so easy. 
Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits and to cast them out and to heal every disease and every sickness. So Jesus put them into action. And then we have a similar description in Luke 9. He called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all the demons, over, yeah, over all the demons and the power to heal diseases. He sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform healings. So, God, so Jesus sent out his disciples to do things. And not just the 12 disciples that we read about, but we read in Luke 10 that he sent out 72 as well. Now after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city, to every city and place where he himself was going to come. So what this tells me is that Jesus is going to send some people out to the places that he wants to show up. So if you feel like you're being called to go do something, it might be because Jesus is trying to show up there. Just something to chew on. And he was saying, and then he was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, plead with the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into the harvest. Go, behold, I am sending you out like lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money belt, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one along the way. Whenever you enter a house, say first, peace be to this house. And if a man of peace is there, your peace will rest upon it. But if not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborers are deserving of their wages. Do not move from this house. Do not move from the house, from house to house. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat what is served to you. And those who are and heal those who are sick, saying to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. And whatever city you enter, they do not receive you. Go out into the streets and say, Even the dust of your city, which clings to our feet, we wipe off and protest against you. Yet be sure of this that the kingdom of God has come near. So we see that Jesus was looking at this as, as healing was honestly a part of the kingdom of God. I mean, if you don't know, there's like not supposed to be any sickness or disease in heaven when we get there. And Jesus didn't just say like, hey, like when he taught us how to pray, right? Because talk about being taught and going into action. When Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, he said, your kingdom come, your will be done, where we're chilling out as it is in heaven. So we look at the kingdom of God, and I think, and I, I don't understand why some people will be like, well, healing's not for today. I, I just don't think that. And I, and if we're supposed to pray for God's kingdom to be here, then I don't know why we shouldn't be going about trying to, to, to see that happen. Um, but, but Jesus sent out his disciples to teach and to, and to do things. He put them into action well before like, this is before we read in Acts when they just received the Holy Spirit, right? This is just power that Jesus said, hey, you have power to go do this. Which leads me into my next point, is we need to learn, be willing to learn from our mistakes. I think a lot of us are so afraid of going out and doing the things that God has called each and every one of us to do as a disciple, right? I think sometimes we get in this habit, and no one in this church, of course, but other Christians, you know what I mean, outside of here, they, they look at this and they're like, oh, well, you know, Pastor will call people forward for healing after church and blah, blah, blah. But the Bible tells us that the apostles, the evangelists, the preachers and the teachers and all them stuff, all the, the fivefold ministry that we all know about, they're, they're there to equip the disciples or the saints to go do the work of the ministry, which is, which is preach the kingdom of God, which is to bring healing, which is to cast out demons. Could you imagine? I like this thought. The Bible tells us that Jesus said that the, these signs will follow those that believe, and the first one is casting out demons. Could you imagine if you ever went to a church and you were like, hey, I'd like to become a part of this church? And they were like, all right, great. Fill out this paperwork, you know, sign here, blah, 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 blah. They're like, okay, one more thing before, you, before we move any further. And they bring up a demon possessed person, they're like, get it out. You know, Matt? Like, you'd be like, first sign of those who believe, cast out, just cast this demon out real quick, and then we'll, yeah, we'll just move right on ahead. Could you imagine? <laughs> But we don't like to think about that. Like, we don't think that way because we've talked about that a number of different ways, and, you know, I'm not here to get into all that. But I think that we, we, we're so afraid of failure, we're so afraid to look goofy, that we don't ever step into the things that God's called us to. And when, when, when we look 
at Scripture, we actually see that the, the disciples made a mistake. In Matthew 17, get there. Missed it. 17, starting in verse 14, it says, When they came to the crowd, a man came up to Jesus, falling on his knees before him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, because he has seizures and suffers terribly. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked him, and the demon came out of him, and the boy was healed at once. But, so we look at this and we see the disciples, for whatever reason, were not able to do what Jesus called them to do, what Jesus told them they could do. But but if we continue to read, we see that they, they didn't stop there. If we read on in verse 19, it says, Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why couldn't we cast it out? And he said to them, Because of your meager faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed and say to this mountain, move from here to there, it will move and nothing will be impossible to you. And I think what so many of us are afraid of is we're afraid that we're going to make God look bad if we don't do the thing he said said we could do. I think we're afraid to step out And when we feel like we've got a word from someone, we're afraid to go step out and do the thing and say that thing to them because we're afraid it may not land with them, right? What if I look silly? I feel like I need to go pray for this person's shoulder, and they go up to me like, hey, is your shoulder messed up? And they're like, no. And you're like, oh, well, this is awkward. Well, I'm going to pray for your shoulder anyway, right? We're afraid afraid to to do what we want to mess things up, but I think that ultimately... Even in the natural, when we see, if we don't push ourselves close to failure, you never grow. And, and what I mean by that is, I know I don't look like it, but I like to work out. And I like the gym, and I like science. And what science actually shows us is that for there to continue to be not just growth, but strength increase, you have to get within proximity to failure. You have to. So many people tend to stall out in the gym or whatever because their squat won't go up because they've been doing the same rep scheme with the same weight and eventually it got easy and they're like, why can't I add any more weight? Well, you're not pushing yourself close enough to failure. And the thing that's even more interesting, when we look at this one particular study, like I said, I like science. When we look at this one particular study that's talking about uh, talking about not just size but strength gains, right? And I think there's something to be said that even in in our spiritual lives. Sometimes so many of us want to have great influence and size, but when you get there, it's shallow. You get there and there's nothing to it, right? Sometimes we, want it, we see this church that is huge and it's massive and it's got six, seven, eight campuses and we're like, oh, great, when we get there, it's dead inside. Me personally, I'd rather have a small church that when people come in these doors, they sense God and God does something incredible and miraculous in them. But this, what this study showed is what they did is they took... They took um, they took two groups of people. And I believe the, the exercise they had them do was leg extension. If you don't know what it is, it's the one where you sit and they put the little pad on there and you kick your legs up. You know what I'm talking about? So what they did is they took the, they did the same amount of, of reps. They just broke it up differently. One group did three sets of 10 and they trained within a proximity to failure within like two reps of, within two reps of failure. They took another group and they did three sets of 10 within two reps of failure. Now, how many know if you're doing less work, you can do more weight? What they found is that the size growth over the course of the time period was the same, but the group who did the heavier weights, did the harder things, saw more strength and size growth. And I wonder if that that can transfer over to, to our walk when so many of us want to do a lot, right? I'll serve here, I'll serve here, I'll serve here, I'll serve here, I'll do this, and I look so good. Look at me. I serve in so many, I serve in so many capacity, and I, do, and I pray 80 times a day, and it's all this, and it's great. Like, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this, but we get there, but you never really pressed into anything. You never really poured into anything. You really never gave the most amount of effort you could into something where it was hard, right? Because we're afraid of failure. 
ultimately. I mean, everyone is. That's, natural, that's a natural human instinct, to be afraid of failure, to be afraid to look like you have egg on your face. But the thing is, is when you're following the call of God, you might stumble a little bit, you might not do the same thing, but there are times where I really believe that God will give you something to go do just to see if you'll do it. It may not seem like it makes a huge impact there in the moment, but it was just to see if, God, if you would. We can't, we can't be afraid of failure, and even when we do, we have to learn from our mistakes. Me as a youth pastor, I make mistakes on the weekly. And I'm surprised I haven't been fired at this point, if I'm being 100% honest. Like, I'm not going to get into it. If you have someone in the youth group, ask about it on Wednesday. I said something on Wednesday, and I was like, crap. Opened up a can of worms, shouldn't have done it. Mistake I made, but I learned from it, right? I've learned from my mistakes. I've learned from, I've learned how to, to make a mistake, and, and honestly, most people don't even notice I made the mistake, right? So we, ha- we can't, don't be afraid of failure. Because ultimately, when you're in God's plan, it's not really failure. It's just a step, right? Just a step. God knows what's about to happen. But you have to learn. And if you are not willing to make, if you're not even willing to make the mistake, then you're never going to move. And when we start to look at the apostles, right? We look at Peter denying Jesus. Denied him three times yet was one of the most outspoken proponents to Jews. When you start reading through the accounts of Jesus, or the accounts of or every time Paul wrote, or every time we see Paul speaking, he's talking to Jews, and when he does, he tells them, he's like, you're the one who crucified Jesus. He became so outspoken against the, what seemed like, especially at the time, an atrocity that happened to a very good man, yet he denied it. He became one of the main apostles, one of the main people that anytime someone got saved or began to believe in Jesus, Peter was one of the first ones to be there. Be like, you need to get filled with the Spirit. He learned from the mistake he made and never denied Jesus, even to the point where he had, where they told him, we're going to kill you. And he said, don't, we're going to crucify you. And he said, don't do that. Don't crucify me like my Savior. Church history tells us that, Paul, that Peter has to be crucified upside down because he didn't feel worthy of being killed in the same instance that his, that his Lord was. But this is all from a man who made a mistake. But he learned. We look at Paul, right? Paul murdered Christians, left and right. He was on his way to go arrest some Christians to kill them when Jesus met him. And he was in, I mean, Paul wrote, depending on who you ask, half to two-thirds of the New Testament, right? Right? I mean, we look at Paul, most of the writings we have in the New Testament, most of the things we know about how to live our Christian life are from Paul, because Paul wrote them. He learned from a mistake. And even, and the interesting thing about Paul, is we look at Paul's discipleship process was 14 years, right? Sometimes we read it and we look at it like, okay, Paul gets saved, gets baptized in the Holy Spirit, it all happens in a couple chapters, a couple of chapters later, he's off traveling and doing whatnot. But we don't realize that was a 14-year gap between him meeting Jesus on the Damascus Road, to actually being sent out. And even something that one of my instructors pointed out to me when we were going through the New Testament, is we look at all these things where it says that God said, I have called you, Paul, to the Gentiles. And we look at every time Paul tried to preach to the Jews, it went really, really bad for him. And we see where Paul's ministry really starts to take off is when he stopped trying to preach to Jews, instead went to the Gentiles. Can we say that Paul made some mistakes? Can we say that Paul learned from his mistakes? So we have to learn and be willing to learn from our mistakes. And the last thing is be sent. I told you we were going to get to the Great Commission. Matthew 28. Missed it. Matthew 28, starting in verse 16. It says, But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus has designated to them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority in heaven, and, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. There's a lot to unpack in this, but we look at this. And we were, he talks about, 
go and make disciples. So the purpose of your discipleship is for you to go and make more disciples. None of us were called to just chill in a seat. That's an important part of your that's an important part of your growth. That's an important part of who you are and what you should do as a, as a church. But so many of us want to just invite someone to church, right? And let the pastor do that part. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Invite people to church. There's a great thing about inviting people to church, especially if you don't know what to do or what to say. But that's no excuse for not learning what to do and what to say. We we look at we we can and something I tell the youth all the time is, and I love this quote. It says, preach the gospel everywhere, and when necessary, use words. We, we, I think so many of us think we have to preach the gospel, and we have to come up and be like the Jehovah's Witness type people, and do, 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 do. you want to know about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's great. Like, you can do that. I'm not, I'm not against, you know, street ministry. I'm not against any of that. I have classmates that do it, like, every day they get out of school, and they go down to 71st and do street ministry. Right? It's great. Good for them. But I think our lives are the bigger part of our ministry. Even for those of us who are called to platform ministries, public ministries, your life is way bigger of a ministry than anything I could ever say from this platform. Because I could say something from this platform, everyone in the church come up here for the altar call, get healed, people get saved, get words, all this kind of stuff. And if I walk out of here and I cuss out my wife and smack around my kids, what does it matter? I hope everyone in the church would be like, Lord Jesus, we need to pray for him. Like, maybe lay, and especially if you're smacking around, smacking around my kid, be like, we need to lay hands on him repeatedly. <laughs> yes. But yeah, we'll pray for your healing as well. So, but our lives are more important than the words we can speak. And I think that's the ultimate point of discipleship. It's to, it's to be taught and to put into action everything that we're taught so the point that when my life exudes Jesus everywhere that I go. So that when I see, like Peter and John, when I see a man sitting there and I don't have anything to give him, what I, I don't have what you're asking for, but what I can give you is in the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. That, that's because of the life that I live, not because of the words that I say. That's because of the things that I've been taught and I've put them in the actions and I've, and, I've, and I've very well could have failed at things, but I've learned from the mistakes that I've made. Maybe I tried to come up and help some dude stand up and walk and it was all in my pride because I wanted to look good. Because I wanted to look like the man of God. And I'm like, stand up and walk and I help the dude up and he falls right back over. Like, well, this is awkward. Sorry, dude. And then you got to call for someone else be like, hey, help my guy out here, right? And then they have an actual humble heart that, that wants to give all the honor and glory to God, and they're able to say, hey, in the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. But we have to be willing to make that mistake. But I can see that, and I can learn from that. I haven't done that, so if y'all are sitting there be like, he tried that. No, I didn't try that. I didn't try that. But I could learn from that and be like, you know what, my heart, there's something wrong in my heart. I've made it all about me and not about him. So we look and look at this. The point of disciples is to create more disciples and to, and to teach, right? I mean, that's where I really think, like, part, eventually you should get to the part, and we read this later on in the New Testament where it says, like, y'all should be to the point where you are now teaching this stuff, not me having to teach you. That might be just be, be in your house. That might just be your kids or whatever your sphere of influence is. Once again, it doesn't have to be up here, but eventually a part of being a disciple is to Teach. To do what Jesus did. Right? Jesus said, greater things than I have done that you will do. And, Je and the biggest part of Jesus' ministry was not the miracles, it was the teaching. Read the Gospels. We see all the, he all the healings and the miracles, and those are awesome. But most of the time it says, Jesus stood up and he got in the synagogue and he taught this. And blah, 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 blah. And there's a whole bunch of red letters, right? So we're called to, to teach and to preach and to do, do things differently. And when we look at this, all the apostles were men who went through this process. All these men of God that we read about, and these women of God that we don't read about as much, but they're in there, right? That were in there. They followed him. They made the choice to follow him. They were chosen and they made the choice. 
they learn, they put into action what they knew, learn from their mistakes, and then they were sent. And when they were sent, that's when we begin to, to read all about the disciples that they created, right? We look at Peter. If you didn't know, pretty sure it's the Gospel of Luke. Luke was a disciple of Peter. We look at Titus and Timothy. These were disciples of Paul. And, these, and, and Titus and Timothy were pastors. If you didn't know, like the books that we get to them is Paul writing to the pastors of the churches that he helped plant. Like, hey, I put you in charge of this. I need you to teach this. So these were disciples that went, went through this same process, right? They made the decision. They made a mistake. I'm sure they made a mistake. And they went. So in closing, um, let's not get hung up on our failures. Let's not get hung up. Let's not get stuck in this in this being taught stage. Now, everyone in this room is probably at different stages of this and could be in different stages of this in different aspects of your spiritual walk, right? Some of us are might know the word really, really well, and you're trying to put it into action, but the spiritual things or the spiritual gifts that we see, you haven't really made, the, you really haven't made steps into that right yet. So it's okay to still be in the teaching stage, but eventually you can only be taught so much where it's time to put into action. And anyone who knows this and anyone who's ever done anything, really, you know that eventually you don't really don't start to learn something until you try to put it into action anyway. So let's not get stuck on putting, being stuck, let's not get stuck in any one of these until you get sent. But even after you get sent, you still have to come back and you need to be taught. You still have to make the decision to do and learn from your mistakes and move on. So I told you I'd keep it short and sweet. If I didn't, I told you I, would, I did. But that's my prayer, is that none of us, that every single one of us will, will make steps and start to move towards this next step, whatever it is. If you've made the decision, to cho- if you've chosen to follow, start learning. Start finding people to be taught, right? Disciples were in close proximity to Jesus. And they were constantly being taught, and they were constantly asking questions of Jesus, trying to learn from him, trying to learn, what can I do? What do I do? How do you do this? How did you do this? Right? And I think that that is ultimately the, the key to being, is one of the keys to being disciples, being in close proximity. Find someone, if there's something that you want to grow in or be taught about, find someone who's doing it. And go to them. And learn. Get in close proximity and just learn. And then put into action what you have. Learn from your mistakes. And then be sent and create other disciples. Right?